invitation. I am very happy to this talk with people. This meeting is being recorded. And uh, to show the story of the universe and how we're trying to learn more about it. So here on my first slide, I show you a picture of the great James Webb Space Telescope launched on Christmas morning uh, last year into space and seems to be working beautifully now that it's almost ready for scientific use. Uh, what we see here is a giant hexagonal mirror, uh, 6.5 meters in diameter. It is protected by uh, five layers of plastic, metallized plastic from the heat of the sun so that it can operate at a very low temperature, about 40 degrees Kelvin, 40 degrees above absolute zero. This is an international project, uh, including uh, NASA, where I work, uh, the European and Canadian space agencies. And it's uh, required about 10,000 people to build it. And it is available now, or will be available, for all astronomers around the world to use. So some of you coming up uh, as young astronomers might be able to do this uh, if we are fortunate and it lasts a long time. So just to give you a small hint of my own history, uh, this is the location where I grew up in uh, New Jersey, um, not too far from New York City, uh, but it was very country, uh, very uh, uh, rural there. Uh, this is a dairy farm for cows and uh, research on dairy cows. My father was a scientist trying to get more milk and better milk from cows. So it was a very beautiful place to grow up, uh, very far from the city and uh, the way that I learned science was to read books that we got from the library. Uh, the library truck came around every two weeks uh, to the farm. And so I would get all the books on science that I could get. That was a long time ago. So uh, stepping back into the history of the universe and how we learned about it, this is a poem from more than 2,000 years ago. Uh, Lucretius wrote it in Latin and, of course, it's been translated to uh, into all languages by now, um, he was aware of the atomic theory that uh, everything that we see is made of tiny invisible particles and that the way they stick together, it governs everything. So he, he wrote that, uh, as you see here, that the tiny particles stick together and they uh, become things you can see and, and give names to. Then uh, as time goes on, they fall apart and disappear from sight. Uh, but at any rate, he was aware of this, um, and uh, they got quite far without being able to prove any of th these ideas. In modern times, we now have a much more complete story about it. Um, for, even from childhood, I think every person wants to know, how did I get here? What was, what was my history? Uh, how is it possible for there to be a special little planet called Earth where we are alive? So here's the story that scientists can tell us now. Uh, number one, uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, this is something that says everything that you've heard about, like uh, electrons or protons or little tiny particles, behaves a little bit like a wave. And similarly, uh, things that we think of as waves, like light waves, also have a particle kind of nature. And it's quite mysterious. But nevertheless, it is the basis of everything. Um, we have the equations uh, from almost a century ago that tell us how to calculate uh, the properties of matter, um, but actually it's much easier to measure things than it is to calculate. So uh, those little particles stick together in patterns that of course control chemistry and biology. So we are here uh, with the shapes that we have because of quantum mechanics. We know that the universe was very hot and compressed and smooth when it was young, and it was has been expanding ever since. <clears throat> the galaxies running apart from each other. We know it's been unstable. It has uh, reorganized itself from a very smooth, simple seeming original condition into the complexity that we see today with galaxies and planets and stars and all those lovely things and people. Uh, it seems that the universe is perhaps infinite in extent. That is to say, there's no boundary, no edge. It just keeps on going and going and going, although obviously we cannot prove that. Uh, it does have an age uh, of about 13.8 billion years. Anyway, it's big enough and old enough that things that seem very unlikely to us 
actually have happened. We have learned about uh, stored information. Uh, you think about it perhaps in terms of computers. Uh, but what we've learned in recent times is that uh, all living things <clears throat> basically uh, read a digital code. The DNA molecules in each cell uh, give digital instructions for how life should proceed. Uh, what's also essential and very difficult for us to understand is what is it that reads the code? The decoding devices in our cells uh, read the code, uh, turn it into proteins, turn it into signals, turn it into instructions for the actual living cells to carry out. We don't understand it and we may never, uh, but it's certainly the beginnings are coming to us and we're understanding more about how it works. Uh, which is valuable for us, of course, if we want to survive for a long time and uh, have good health, because, of course, all living things use this system, um, and they're just as determined as we are to stay alive. Uh, we've learned as engineers how to build feedback loops. A feedback loop is a control system that stabilizes something. So if you have a thermostat in your house that uh, controls the temperature, that's a very elementary kind of control system. Uh, biological things have control systems of much greater complexity, but they are able to maintain our identity. Biologists call it homeostasis, uh, the ability of living things to maintain their shape and form and identity, even though we're constantly exchanging matter, atoms, uh, so forth, with the environment around us. And most of the cells in my body have been replaced by other ones. Most of the atoms have been replaced. Nevertheless, I am still approximately the same recognizable person as I was when I was five years old. So we have learned about the early universe by taking a picture. Uh, we uh, recognized in 1965 that the expanding universe had uh, been very hot and that we could still measure that heat. Um, and then we found out much more recently, because we made a map with this satellite that was mentioned to you in the introduction, the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite made a map of the sky. Uh, we, the sky is uh, luminous, uh, and here we see it as a wavelength of about two or three millimeters, um, and we see hot and cold spots. Uh, this is a picture of the universe as it was when it was about 400,000 years old, and it became transparent. So light has been coming and traveling through the universe ever since then, more or less unimpeded without hitting anything. So that's how we are able to take this picture. Uh, we interpret this picture to say, these show that the early universe was filled with random fluctuations of temperature and density. And uh, those random fluctuations um, come from some unknown process in the very much earlier universe which we do not understand at all. But at any rate, here we are. These are the, the conditions of the early universe. And if we should understand them, we ought to be able to calculate what happens next. We ought to be able to understand how the uh, expanding universe would enable the formation of galaxies. The idea we have is that the gravity acting on the most dense regions in the early times was able to stop the expansion of the material and pull it back in and make galaxies. So we're here uh, talking about this because there were spots, random spots in the early universe and gravity stopped the expansion locally. So we built a telescope to find out more details about this. <clears throat> this is called the James Webb Space Telescope. It's named after the second administrator of NASA. Uh, he was the person who made a plan to go uh, and sent astronauts to the moon. And he was very good at it. It took us eight years after it was announced that we would do this, we actually succeeded. To me, that's almost miraculous. At any rate, here uh, we show pictures of the telescope itself and, uh, and mentioned that it was launched on Christmas day last year. <clears throat> I'll show you a little bit more about it next. So here is a video showing the launch of the observatory. Uh, cameras at the base of the launch facility. Uh, this particular rocket was launched from French Guiana on the north, north coast of South America. Decollage. 
Webb's liftoff from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself, James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. So it is, of course, on the coast of South America because it's part of the European contribution to the mission. Uh, so Europe bought the rocket and the European uh, rocket company, Ariane Spas, uh, uses that facility. So uh, it was a perfect launch. We went straight to where we want to go. Uh, and then within the next two weeks, we had to do this, as I'm showing you the video of uh, the unfolding of the telescope. Uh, first, we unfold the solar panels to get solar power uh, to run the observatory. Uh, we unfold the antenna to be able to talk back and forth to the telescope. Then we unfold the uh, protective structures that will spread out to make the sunshade, the umbrella that protects the telescope from the sun. Here we are enrolling protective covers over the sunshade itself. This is an extremely complicated structure, uh, but it seems to be necessary. It's the only way we know to make the observations that we will need to find out about the very first galaxies of the universe, uh, the way that stars grow inside dust clouds today, and to learn about all of the mysteries that we started to understand. So this all was done by remote control in the first two weeks after launch. After it was all unfolded, it was still not ready to use. Uh, the telescope is still warm uh, and it glows and emits infrared light. It's also not yet in focus. So we've cooled it down and we've focused the telescope now and we're quite pleased with it because it seems to be perfect. This is where we sent it. We're sending it. Uh, it is now orbiting around a place called the Sun-Earth Lagrange point. In the middle of the picture of the sun, and you see the Earth to the right of it, uh, and the Moon orbiting around the Earth. Earth. The Lagrange point L2 is 1.5 million kilometers from the Earth, about 1% uh, of the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So the picture is not in scale. Uh, but this is an, an example of <clears throat> a special spot where uh, the combined gravity of the Earth and the Sun will pull the telescope around the Sun once a year. So we can stay near the Earth all the time uh, in this orbit. We focused the telescope, and this is an image of a portion of the Magellanic Cloud. The Magellanic Cloud is a small galaxy that, or that orbits the Milky Way, uh, and you can see it in the southern hemisphere. Um, and we can see we're getting nice sharp pictures, as we hoped. And that was a proof uh, for, our, for our scientists and our engineers that we had done the right thing. Uh, we also, here's another small piece of that picture comparing um, the image we had with the previous telescope and with the new telescope. You can see that the new one is much better. It shows many more objects and they're much sharper images. So we're very pleased with this. Uh, we are expecting to make great discoveries. You can also see in this picture that there are dust clouds uh, in the space between the stars. So there's not just stars out there, there's dust in space as well. So we have four major scientific themes for the mission. Um, we want to see the first objects that grew from the Big Bang material. It is predicted that they could have happened in about 100 million years after the expansion began. Um, no one actually knows this, uh, it's just a prediction. So that means if nature has given us something to see, we should look for it. Uh, then uh, as time passed, uh, the universe uh, uh, got brighter and brighter. There were more and more objects uh, lighting up. And uh, so we'd like to see that history. We'd like to see how the Milky Way grows. Our Milky Way galaxy that we live in has about 100 billion stars. Um, and it has this beautiful spiral shape that uh, we have deduced. Uh, we would like to know how that happened. So we can't, of course, see the Milky Way itself. Um, looking back in time, but we can see what galaxies were like elsewhere farther back in time. Uh, as you know, we look back in time by looking at things that are very far away. 
Uh, so if you look far enough away, you can see almost all the way back towards the beginning of time. Uh, we will be looking inside clouds of dust where stars are being born today, uh, along with their planets. Uh, and we have a picture there called the Eagle Nebula. We'll come back to it in a moment. And finally, we would like to know more about planets themselves. We will be looking at planets around other stars and planets here in the solar system. We carry four instruments all board, on board the observatory. Uh, they are cameras, just taking pictures, uh, different wavelengths, and spectrometers, which spread out the light of the stars or galaxies into a, uh, basically a rainbow. Uh, you spread out the light into the colors in order to see what are the chemicals that are inside it, uh, how hot it is, and how it is moving. Uh, so we have a complete set of instruments for astronomers to use uh, that cover all the wavelengths ranging from 0.6 micrometers, that is red wavelengths that you could see with your eye, all the way out to 28 microns, which uh, is much too long a wavelength for you to be able to pick up. So the telescope is extraordinarily sensitive. <clears throat> we can see if you were a small insect, uh, one square centimeter at the distance of the moon from the earth, we would be able to see you, uh, both the sunlight you reflect and the heat you emit. So it's extraordinary. Uh, it's, it means that the telescope is very powerful and almost perfect. Uh, we also can see very bright objects. Uh, it's very hard for us to do that, but we know how. And so we'll even be able to observe Mars with it. Uh, we can track moving objects in the solar system. <clears throat> and so we can see everything from Mars on outwards. We mentioned here that Oumuamua uh, this is the name of a comet that came through the solar system a few years ago and seems to have come from way outside the solar system. So when the next one comes, we will be ready for it. We will be looking at places like this in the sky. This is a picture taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and what we see here are basically one or two stars, uh, plus many thousands of galaxies. And when the astronomers took this picture with the Hubble, they said it's beautiful, um, but it also shows us that we have not been able yet to see far enough back in time, far enough away in space to see the formation of the very first galaxies. So please build us another telescope that's more like the James Webb and, and let us answer that question. So that's the hardest problem we're working on is this one. We will be looking in clouds like this one this is called the Pillars of Creation, uh, also called the Eagle Nebula, because it's to some people, that's what it looked like. Um, on the left-hand side, you see the picture that we take with this Hubble Space Telescope using visible wavelengths. And you can see the dust clouds there are, are beautiful, but they're also very opaque. You cannot see through the dust. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have the infrared picture taken with the Hubble, and you you can see that the dust clouds are much less opaque. We can see stars right through them in some parts. <clears throat> uh, we would like to see inside these clouds to see how stars are being born as we speak today. Uh, about uh, one or two new stars are born every year in the Milky Way. And so uh, there's a lot going on out there. Uh, in particular, we want to know how stars like the solar system uh, and the sun are born and, uh, and whether they we can see the signs of planets being born along with them. We will be looking at objects in the solar system. Um, here are two uh, fascinating examples. Europa is a satellite of Jupiter and was discovered, discovered by Galileo himself um, with a very small telescope. And you can see Europa with binoculars. Uh, when we sent a probe out there a few years back, uh, we got this picture of the surface we now see that Europa is covered with ice and there's a liquid ocean under the ice. And sometimes when we watch it with the Hubble telescope, we see water vapor is coming out from the cracks between the ice blocks. So this is now a new target for a NASA mission. Uh, we would like to fly a probe through the water clouds and see if there are organic molecules in that water that's coming out of those cracks. Of course, we will be watching it with the Webb telescope as well. On the right-hand side, I show you a geological map of the surface of Titan. 
Titan is the largest moon of Saturn. It is the only moon in the solar system that has its own atmosphere and weather. Uh, Saturn is uh, far from the sun, so this satellite is very cold. Uh, the surface is uh, not quite down to the temperature of liquid nitrogen, but it's very cold. There is, uh, ox there is gaseous nitrogen atmosphere here, and it's enough to fly a helicopter. In fact, we are planning to send a helicopter uh, as part of the landing uh, expedition there uh, with a robot probe uh, in about 2035. So we'll be studying this satellite as well to see if there are signs of interesting organic chemistry. Um, the surface uh, has lakes and rivers and that are filled with liquid hydrocarbons, methane and ethane, which here we get from the ground to use for fuel. Uh, on the surface of Titan, they come as rain from clouds. So this is a fascinating place to explore and we will be following it up because it is so much like Earth, except it's much colder. We will be looking at planets around other stars. We have two ways, of course. One is to try to take a picture that shows a little dot next to the bright star. The other way, way that is very powerful for us is to wait for a planet to go in front of the star. When a planet goes in front of the star, it blocks some starlight. And maybe if the planet has an atmosphere, some of the starlight will go through that atmosphere on its way to our telescope. In that case, we can spread out that light with a spectrometer into different wavelengths and get the colors and uh, recognize the chemical effects of water or other things that might be in the atmosphere of those planets. So there's a possibility, uh, which we can't tell yet or not, that there is a small planet that's roughly the size of Earth that has enough water in its atmosphere that you could say, maybe it has an ocean. Maybe it's a little bit like home. Maybe it's alive. Maybe it could be alive. Um, but we will not actually be able to know if it's alive with this kind of measurement. So um, this is coming up. Uh, we will be starting as soon as we can. Um, we hope to have the telescope ready for observations by the end of June, which is only a month away. And then uh, soon after that, be able to announce initial results and uh, start a scientific program. So you can follow along uh, all, by the way, if you're going to be an astronomer, you will be able to use this telescope. Uh, the way that you use it is you send us a proposal. And if you write us a good proposal, you might get chosen to, uh, to use the telescope. Um, in particular, we will not know who you are or where, you're, where you are when we receive your, your proposal. Uh, or I should say, at least the people who re read and review the proposal uh, will not know. You have a fair shot uh, at getting chosen if your idea is good. So you can follow along in many ways with the uh, project uh, progress. We have social media, we have websites. You can find everything if you Google uh, or search the internet for uh, James Webb Space Telescope or JWST. So before I go and uh, open up for questions though, I would like to say there are also telescopes being built in, on the ground now, which are even bigger though than the ones that we couldn't put in space. Uh, and the biggest one is European. <clears throat> it's the 39 meter diameter telescope. It's being built on a mountain in uh, Chile in the mountains um, at a high altitude. Uh, so this is a telescope that is six times as large as the Webb and it will also be very powerful. But of course, it also can't see uh, at wavelengths when it, where the air blocks our view. So I will be very happy to have questions from all of you and please uh, feel free to ask. Right, thank you very much. Thank you very much for a great, great lecture. And then we start from our questions. Um, how Hubble is better than Webb, except of uh, course mirror size? Uh, how Hubble and Webb are different? Uh, well, I guess clearly the Webb is bigger which makes it more powerful. It's also designed to pick up infrared light. Uh, Hubble telescope uh, can pick up ultraviolet, visible light, and near infrared out to wavelengths of 1.7 micrometers. 
Uh, the Webb telescope begins at 0.6 microns and goes way out to much longer infrared wavelengths. So it can pick up uh, objects that are too cool uh, for, for them to shine at uh, visible wavelengths. It can pick up objects from the most distant universe, and it can pick up objects uh, that are hidden inside dust clouds. So that's what makes it different uh, and why we can do different kinds of science with it. All right. Uh, does there exist any street for a telescope such as Webb or Hubble, such as Duster, for example? Uh, could you say that again, please? Uh, does there exist any threats for telescopes such as Webb or Hubble? Does there any, exist any threats? What? Uh, um, you mean? Uh, Something that can damage or something else. Oh, I see. Um, yes, uh, all telescopes can be damaged. Uh, so yes, the, the Hubble telescope and the Webb telescope are in outer space and there are dangerous particles out there. Um, in particular, <clears throat> what we love to see uh, here on Earth as a meteor shower is actually dangerous to all space payloads. And so, yes, there are hazards. Uh, we think we're okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. The next one is there a theoretical possibility to see the beginning of the Big Bang? Oh, my goodness. Um, not with this telescope. Um, the closest that we have gotten is to measure the cosmic microwave radiation. The picture that I showed you with the hot and cold spots in it is the closest we can get um, of a direct kind of observation. So that's when the universe is about 400,000 years old. Uh, everything uh, before that is uh, interpretation. Okay, well, relic radiation ever end? Uh, the, about the relic radiation? Is it, uh, will it ever could be end? Can we? Uh, will, the, will the relic radiation ever end? Yeah. It will, it will, it fills the universe now and it will continue to get colder as the universe gets older and the universe continues to expand, but it will always be there. So even a trillion years from now, there will be still the residue of the Big Bang. All right, let's go to a little bit common, uh, common questions. Um, what do you like the most about working with NASA? I like uh, working on very interesting problems with brilliant people. The, uh, my colleagues, uh, my fellow scientists and my fellow engineers uh, are ready to solve impossible problems and, uh, and, and we do it for the entire world to use. So I'm very pre pleased with that. So um, maybe you all have a chance to come work with us. Thank you. Uh, the next one is, tell us about your exper experience at the Nobel Prize ceremony, how difficult it was this past, and tell some advices for young uh, astronomers, young scientists. Oh my goodness. Well, the um, Nobel uh, Prize experience is a great pleasure. Um, the, uh, it the, uh, there's a ceremony, but it basically it's uh, 10 days of parties and speeches and parties and speeches. And uh, it's a great deal of fun. Uh, of course, I was very worried because uh, I'm not used to that. Uh, I, I work in my lab, I talk to my friends about astronomy and suddenly everybody is watching me. So I'm a little worried that I might make a mistake but nothing bad happened. So recommendations for future scientists. Um, I think it's very important to work on something that you think is important. Uh, and um, rec being recognized by a prize is nice, but it's more important to know that what you do is important to you. All right, thank you very much. It was a great time, great, great pleasure to talk with you today. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, I get that very soon, Probably we will meet and make uh, in, an in-person lecture in Kyiv, uh, and I hope that will be very soon.
Well, thank you for the invitation. I uh, visited Kiev myself in person as a tourist many years ago, and we loved being there. So uh, best well, of luck to all of you. Tell us a little bit about experience in Kiev. <laughs> yes. So anyway, thank you for the invitation. And, uh, and you are welcome to send questions uh, to me directly also after the talk. All right, thank you.